chance to come to talk about their uh, topics, but which now has undergone a transformation. It's undergone a transformation in the sense that uh, it is now organized uh, on a regular basis with some really top speakers organized by uh, Natalie and Chubranch, who have done an excellent job in putting this all together. So I'm actually honored that I can chair the very first lecture in this range of uh, lectures. And uh, I think we'll, we'll talk during this lecture on a topic which is extremely relevant for the Brussels School of International Studies and for the discipline of international relations, because today's topic will be dealing with decolonization of academia, of the UK academy specifically, I see on the title on the slides, um, which is a very relevant topic. The ones that you are familiar with, uh, Chakrabarti's work, for example, will know that he claims that Europe has at the global scale been already very much provincialized, but the ideas of Europe have not been provincialized and are still very much determining the way we think. And if he speaks about European ideas, he refers to ideas of modernity, ideas of enlightenment, Western ideas of modernity. And there is, it is actually extremely striking for a discipline like international relations that it is still very much a, shall I call it, Western biased discipline, a discipline that is to a large extent run by Western academics, where Western frameworks of thought are still extremely dominant. So I think this is an excellent topic to open the lecture uh, series. And I'm very happy that we have Robbie Schilling here to talk about this uh, topic. Robbie is a reader in international relations at uh, Queen Mary, the University of London. Uh, he has a DPhil from uh, Sussex, and he has been doing research specifically on this topic and in the field of colonial studies, I think I may say, uh, dealing, for example, with the uh, critical investigation of European narratives on enslaved Africans, dealing with uh, global interconnections between colonized subjects. Uh, actually, he worked specifically on the influence of black power and Rastafari movements on indigenous people in the South Pacific. And you also have a book coming out uh, on that, if I'm correct, and on the broader topic, of course, of uh, decolonizing international relations theory. Uh, Robert Shillian has an impressive uh, list of publications. He has published in many of the most relevant IR journals, specifically the ones with a quite strong theoretical uh, approach, like Millennium, like Review of International Studies, like uh, European Journal of International Relations, Cambridge Review of International Affairs, and so on. He has also published several books on these uh, topics. But it's maybe also interesting to mention that you are an active blogger uh, because I had a look at your uh, blog okay. and read that you had posted yesterday something, for example, on the fights around the Kurdish city of Kobani uh, and the role of the IS and especially the Western text. So I very much recommend you the blog. It's really interesting uh, to read. And also notice you're an advisor to the Rastafari Global Council. Uh, I wonder why that is, but as, as an old fan of Bob Marley, I can only uh, uh, very much uh, praise that. We're very happy you're here. Uh, we'll give you the floor for uh, a lecture of about uh, 45 minutes, and then there will be time for questions and answers. So please. Thanks, Tom. Thanks very much. Um, well, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and uh, thanks, uh, Shibrain Shu and Natalie, for looking after me so well so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you'll come to me. Um, and we had a a nice little workshop earlier on this morning, um, which dealt with quite a few of the um, topics that we're going to deal with today. Well, I'm going to do a lot of things in this lecture, um, and I'm going to cover a lot of ground, and hopefully your head won't spin. Hopefully you won't see my head spin. Um, but the purpose of it is, is in the spirit of the lecture series is to do a, a number of things, to combine um, critical thinking in international relations, people call it IR, if you're not in it then it will sound weird, but IR is international relations, um, combine that with a uh, ethical engagement with theorising from different contexts, that's an ethical challenge, um, and especially the context that I'm looking at is the Pan-African context. And combining all of that um, with the challenge of linking university to publics, um, or trying to relink universities to publics. And what I'm going to be talking about is especially black publics. And that is um, the kind of ground zero for me in terms of decolonizing the academy. So lots of things going on. See how we go. Hopefully the connections will appear, um, but I'm really interested to see what you think about it all. 
Let me start off. Hands up if you do international relations. All right. Um, keep your hands up if. <laughs> That's right. Something's wrong. <laughs> Bing. Just turn it off and on again. One. This one. Yeah. Uh, it's at the, the on the time. side. At the side. Oh, oh, something happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yay. Anybody read this guy? Hands up if you read this guy. Something. Yeah. If you do international relations, chances are you'll definitely have read this guy. Right? E.H. Carr, it's a founding text for international relations. In the text, he talks about um, the interwar crisis between you know, the First World War and the Second World War, um, and the slide from this wonderful idea of the League of Nations into um, yet more war, a more vicious war. Okay, and in it, he talks about realism and utopianism and the idea that we can all get along and it challenges that with realism, the idea that there's power politics and power politics is what wins out in the international sphere. Chances are you probably wouldn't have read this guy. And this guy, you did. <laughs> this guy um, was at the very heart of this crisis, this interwar crisis. The, the most important point in the interwar period was when Italy, a fully paid up member of the League, invaded Ethiopia, another fully paid up member of the League, and the League did nothing. Let me read to you this speech um, that Haile Selassie gives to the League in 1936. I assert that the problem submitted to the Assembly today is a much wider one. It's not merely a question of the settlement of Italian aggression. It is collective security. It's the very existence of the League of Nations. It's the confidence that each state places in international treaties. It's the value of promises made to small states that their integrity and their independence shall be respected and ensured. It's the principle of the equality of states on the one hand, or otherwise, the obligation laid upon small powers to accept the bonds of vassalship. In a word, it is international morality that is at stake. Have the signatures appended to a treaty value only insofar as the signatory powers have a personal, direct and immediate interest involved? Now that's a section of the speech. And in that speech you'll find very theoretical concepts. International morality, collective security interest versus the common good. It's a political speech as well. It's at the League of Nations. It's real live international relations. Why is it that IR scholars and students especially won't read this speech but they'll read that book which is a report on the crisis when the concepts which this book is talking about Many of them are present in that speech. So I'm asking why. And I'm thinking about this um, question in the context of black academia. In fact, in the UK, black students are the highest percentage increase of students across all ethnic groups. In fact, really overrepresented, you might say in relation to the uh, percent population which are black in Britain. Yet they won't read, probably, a single text by a black intellectual. <coughs> they probably won't be taught by a black academic. And any time that Africa is mentioned, chances are it will be in a pathological way. It will be about failed states, human rights, Ebola and Madonna. The picture is shocking because it's a majority black academy there in the room. And it's shocking because 
there was a lack of presence in the academy when it comes to black scholars. There's a massive lack of presence. So that's why I'm thinking about this question. Why is it that people read E.H. Karma but don't read Haile Selassie? I'm thinking about it in this context, which is actually quite a political and public context. Why is it when there is a growth in black students that there is no corresponding democratization of theory, of texts, of concepts, of what we call earlier in the day of the episteme? what is said to be scientific knowledge, useful knowledge. And I'm going to address this problem, I'm going to have a provocation about it, um, by looking at Pan-African pedagogy. And I get to the person that I'm really looking at, Edward Blyden, quite late in the day actually, but I'm going to take you through a number of stages before, just so that I can pursue this problem. Why is it that there is a lack of presence, both epistemological, i.e., you know, what it is, what can we count as being knowledge, but also physical in terms of, well, who is providing the knowledge? Why is there a lack of that when in actual fact there is an increase in black students? And even if we weren't talking about that, this is at the centre of the world at this point in time. Why aren't people reading that speech in their first weeks of international relations? Oh, I've gone all the way back. So the first thing that I want to set up in order to kind of work through this provocation that I'm giving about why is there a lack of black presence? The first, the first thing I want to do is to set it up by just looking at this pair of concepts, coloniality and decoloniality. So the concepts come from, in academically speaking, the concepts come from a body of work which has arisen from scholars mainly based in Latin America and the global south in general, but especially Latin America. Okay? And they've developed these concepts in part as a critique of post-colonial studies, but more so as a critique of the abiding Eurocentrism um, in the Western Academy. However, a lot of what they're talking about actually comes from outside the Academy. So the knowledge traditions that they're using as their inspirations aren't actually academic ones in the formal sense, but come from indigenous cosmologies and struggles, from uh, various African diasporic struggles and cosmologies. Okay, so it's not something which is invented or created in, in the academy, but it's actually something which has been moved into the academy now through this pair of concepts called coloniality and decoloniality. And there's a relationship between coloniality and decoloniality. Let's tease out what these terms are, what the relationship is. So my friends that, uh, who were part of this workshop we were doing in the morning will recognise this picture. This is um, a, a map which was um, uh, produced just shortly after the Treaty of Fordicillus in 1494 and that treaty was part of a papal book whereby the, um, the, the Pope said, okay, you Spanish and you Portuguese, you're fighting about, you know, who's going to get what in the Americas. Let's have an agreement. We'll draw a line down the Azores. Anything east of the line, the Portuguese get. Anything west of the line, the Spanish get. And then a similar line was drawn 30 years later on the other part of the world, the east part of the world, um, and that was the Treaty of um, Sarbosa. The interesting thing about this map, you might see, is that there are blank areas, right? There are blank areas. But this is a map, which is a, this is a treaty which is about jurisdiction. In other words, we don't know who's there. We don't know what they do. We don't know what they call themselves. We don't know what they practice. We don't know what law they have. But we do know that they are ours. So the first thing about coloniality is that it erases presence. It erases presence. Existing presence, it erases it. Because now we've erased it, it doesn't matter what they think, what they call themselves. We'll tell them who they are, we'll name them, 
and we'll tell them what they think. Just there's nothing there. Here's another aspect of coloniality. This is a map um, of the British Empire in 1886, just before the big land grab in Africa, by the way. Um, and what it does is it arranges all the um, peoples who are in the colonial worlds, whether those be the dominions or the, or the colonies, around the edges. And you'll see that there are settlers there, um, there, and there are indigenous people there as well. And the interesting thing about this map is to see where everybody is looking. Everybody is looking to Britannica. Everybody's looking to Britannica. These people, they're not looking at each other. They can't look at, they're not allowed to look at each other. They can only ever look to Britannica. So we know the phrase, all roads lead to Rome. We know how colonial administration organized routes all across the globe. Everything had to go back to the imperial centers. And chances are, there was very little movement sideways. All the travel routes had to go back to the center. But same way, actually, with, with the actual conception of peoples. So everybody could only gain their integrity by looking towards Britannica, and Britannica would tell them who they were. They couldn't look at each other and work out how they were related to each other. All they could do was look at Britannica. So this is another kind of frame of coloniality. It's about subalternization. Right? It's about subalternization. Even if you haven't erased a present a presence. All that is left is for someone to be present. But that person who is present doesn't have a presence because their actual being doesn't actually change anything. It doesn't affect anybody. It's only Britannica who can change or affect anybody. She'll tell them who they are. So the other part about coloniality which I want to get across to you is that there's a difference between, even if you haven't been erased, there's a difference between being present and having presence. Having presence means you matter. Being present just means you're in the room. So right now, because you're not speaking back to me, you're just present. <laughs> I've got the presence. <laughs> but if we had to pass the mic around, then you would get presence. You see what I'm saying? Coloniality is basically a, a lecture room, but, but with no speaking back. So we've got erasure and we've got subalternization. That is the making present, but not with presence. And then we've got one other aspect. And this is how these moments of erasure and subalternization actually become part of the framework of classical European thought. And I call it epistemic difference, and I'll tell you what that means. Much of classical European thought is it makes a division between speculative reason, that is, you, you, you work in your mind, and you work universally in abstract, and you think, okay, what can be said to exist? How can we study it? What is right? What is wrong? Okay? And then there's another part of classical European thought, which is not about speculative reason, but it's about who are they? Ah, oh, they are those people. They are those people. They are those people. Right? And the two are actually quite different, and they often do not meet in classical European thought. There's a real reason why that's the case. Because if you can be said to reason, if you have the capacity, the capability, the competency to reason, then you can be said to be fully human. If you don't have the capacity to reason, then you are said to be not competently human. You become 
the anthos, the, the, the people there. They're not human, they're just things which we study, which look human, but they're not fully human because they can't reason. Let me give you an example about what I mean. Here's Kant, we all know Emmanuel Kant, critique of practical reason, lovely bit of speculative reason, act that the maximum of your will could always hold at the same time as a principle establishing universal law, meaning do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. Okay? That's Kant's text on speculative reason. But Kant also writes anthropologies. He writes anthropologies. And this is a part of one of his anthropologies called Observations on the Feeling of the Beautiful and the Sublime. Father Labatt reports that a Negro carpenter whom he reproached for haughty treatment towards his wives answered, you whites are indeed fools. For first you make great concessions to your wives and afterwards you complain when they drive you mad. And it might be that there was something in this which perhaps deserved to be considered. So Kant is a, is a bigger, basically. Um, but in short, this fellow was quite black from head to foot, a clear proof that what he said was stupid. Now, what Kant is saying there is that epidemiology, the, the epidermis, the colour of your skin, de facto, it, 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 it tells you that whatever that person says is unreasonable. So his anthropology divides up humanity. He has speculative reason where apparently we're all the same and we can all reason. But when it comes to his anthropology, it's only some human beings who can reason and other human beings can't reason. They can't reason competently. <coughs> oh, I keep pressing the wrong button. Here's Hegel. Apparently the opposite to Kant, right? Here's his bit of speculative reason, the phenomenology of spirit. Oh, self-consciousness is based, but oh, God, do I have to read it? <laughs> Basically, he's saying, we find ourselves in each other. That's what recognition is about. You know, I have to recognise you so that you recognise me. The process of recognition is what actually develops our self-consciousness, right? So our self-consciousness is, is based upon and dependent upon an act of recognition between ontological equals, right? is Kant's philosophy of history, the anthropological bit. Man, as we find him in Africa, has not progressed beyond his immediate existence. For this very reason, we cannot properly feel ourselves into his nature, no more than into that of a dog. So what Hegel is saying there is, how can I recognise myself in an African? They're not, they're, they're not competently human. I can't recognise. So again, what you see, in European thought is a part of the coloniality that I was talking about, which is about erasure and subalternization of certain peoples. That itself gets constituted through classical European thought, whereby some people are seen to be the reasoners and others cannot be said to be competently reasoners. Therefore, they are not competent human. Therefore, we have a different relationship to them. Of course, lots of this was based on travelogues, which came back from European sojourners of far off places. And the travelogues formed the repository of what came to be known as classical anthropology. And what classical anthropology did was it put back some people in time. So the Europeans were at the head of time, they were in the telos, they were the telos of humanity. How they were developing was how all humanity will develop eventually. But these other peoples, they were living fossils. They were, oh, how the Europeans used to be, way back in time. Fascinating, because the, you know, it's the land that time forgot. They're fossils in the present. So when we study them, what we do is we study our own past but they are not contemporaneous to us. They're not contemporaneous. They're not our contemporaries. We show them their future. So what classical anthropology did is it mapped out this epistemic difference that I'm talking about. We can be known, you and others. It mapped it 
into time. The knowers are the people who are present. The known are the people who are the past, but they're just past living in the present. Social anthropology coming up. And what social anthropology did in the early 20th century is it said, no, no, we're not going to do all that old classical anthropology stuff. It's kind of a little bit embarrassing, to be honest. What we're going to do is we're going to say everybody is a contemporary. Yes, everybody is a contemporary, but there are differences in space. <coughs> so what we will do is we will use our modern social scientific methods to create segregations in space, whereby the natives do culture, but we, the Europeans, we do social. And the social is university is universal, and culture is particular. So we, even if these people are our contemporaries, they are particulars. They can't actually conceive of the whole because they are caught in their culture. They have no tools whereby they can actually grasp at universals. Whereas we, it so happens, luckily enough, our culture is the social, sociology, the social, and the social is universal. So we can actually tell them about themselves. So whilst classical anthropology mapped the epistemic difference in terms of the present and the past, social anthropology, and used words like savage and barbarian and civilized, social anthropology did it in the present, but spatially. So there are native cultures, and then there is modern society. These are all native cultures, modern society. I am modern society, and as modern society, I am going to observe and examine and tell you what your particular culture is all about and what meaning it has. But you can't do the same thing back to me. Well, things carried on, and um, social anthropology had some kind of relationship to what is known as the sociology of knowledge tradition, people like Karl Mannheim. And out of these traditions came social constructivism, which took the ac academia, it, you know, it kind of flamed up in academia in the 1960s, and it, if you do international relations, international relations caught up with it about 30 or 40 years later, and now everybody's a constructivist in international relations, right? And um, <coughs> what social constructivism did is it mapped epistemic difference, not in terms of time or in terms of space, but in terms of subjectivities. In terms of subjectivities, not time or space, but subjectivities. And I've included a picture of Anthony Giddens because he exemplifies this move. He came up with this term, the double hermeneutic. I don't know if anybody's ever come across that term. And the double hermeneutic basically says, look, everybody interprets everybody else. We're all interpreters. Any social action has to be interpreted. And because that is an ontological proposition, it's the nature of social being that everybody interprets. Everybody's an interpreter, which is great. It's like democratic. So in one minute, you kind of think, ah, oh, there's no epistemic difference here. There are not knowers and knowns. There are just interpreters. We're all interpreters. But then, Gideon says, ah, oh, but some, some people, their interpretations can actually affect other people's interpretations and other people's actions. And we'll call them the scientists. And we'll call the people who don't have an interpretive faculty which is sufficient to affect other people's interpretive faculties, we'll call those other people's the land. And so the scientific frameworks are frameworks which are more universal than lay frameworks, because the scientific frameworks travel. They influence. They have a presence. Lay interpretations are merely present. They don't change things. They get acted upon and they get transformed. Now, Giddens owes a lot of that to the sociology of knowledge tradition, Karl Mannheim. And Mannheim makes a clear statement and he says, modern people's modernity is especially self-reflexive in its sociality. 
So modernity and modern peoples, they are the ones who are able to be reflexive and self-reflexive to a degree, qualitatively, that is different to traditions, natives, single mothers, poor people. So what I'm trying to say to you is that um, what we have here is a whole set in the academy, a whole set of reinterpretations of epistemic difference, whereby those who are erased or are made only present, right? That's that's why they're erased or made only present in the academy, because there is this epistemic difference which is going on, articulated in various ways in time, in space, in subjectivity. Nevertheless, the difference is clearly says there are some people who can tell other people about themselves, but those other people can't say nothing back or can't explain themselves. They have to be explained. Does that make kind of basic sense for the moment? All right. Decoloniality, so that's coloniality. Decoloniality is basically questioning that. It's questioning those premises. For example, what it will say is it will say that actually those things weren't erased, but they were attempted. There was an attempted erasure. But those peoples who were there, they're living by those traditions. They live, they carry on. The project, the colonial project, is to erase, but it never can erase. So in actual fact, there are living knowledge traditions which carry on. For example, this map from, it's an Aztec map, right from the 1600s. What it narrates is actually nothing really to do with colonizers. It narrates 400 years of arguments and wars between peoples in the Aztec Empire. Right, and that's from the 1600s. So the first thing about decoloniality is that it retrieves living knowledge traditions and it says, no, if you think in terms of erasure, if you assume erasure, you're complicit in genocide, especially epistemic genocide, but practical genocide as well. So when people say, for example, oh yeah, you know like the indigenous people in the Americas, in North America, yeah, yeah, they, they had a gen, yeah, you know, they got killed, there was a genocide. You're complicit in the act of genocide because they didn't get killed. They're still around. And they still have their living knowledge traditions. And their living knowledge traditions are in deep, intimate relationships with the colonial powers. But they are not under the colonial powers. They have integrity in and of themselves in relation. Here's another thing which the um, decoloniality thing says. There are no subalterns. There are no subalterns. There are relatable peoples. And relatable peoples don't require their meaning to be given by the Britannica, by the master, by the colonial master. The meanings that they give to themselves and the meanings that travel between them actually don't require or depend acknowledgement, justification, acceptance, interpretation by a master. They carry on. This is a very small, stupid example um, recently, but hopefully it conveyed to you the point. Right? These people in Gaza are twittering the people in Ferguson. You know in Ferguson in the US, you know, I think? Yeah. And they're saying, this is how you deal with um, tear gas. Right? But it's not something that Twitter created. <laughs> this is actually a condition, a condition of, of globality, which has existed for a long, long time, ever since 1492 and before that as well. So let me, um, oh, keep pressing on. Let me just sum up what I'm saying about this framework, so that we can move forward with it. Coloniality is all about creating epistemic difference. Those who know and those who can only be known. 
It's a fundamental framework of coloniality. We divide the world into two categories. Those categories might be taken and might constantly transform, but the structuring principle is the same. All epistemic roads lead to master. Only master can interpret others adequately. Others have to be interpreted themselves. They can't <coughs> interpret themselves or their relationships with others. Master has to do the interpretation. Because of that, what they do, what coloniality does, what it has to do, is it has to consistently delegitimize living knowledge traditions of the colonized and also of the post colonized. It has to consistently do that. And even if these knowledge traditions are present, they don't have a presence. They could be like data. But they themselves, these living knowledge traditions, can't tell you something general about the world or about Europe. They're just data for Europe to make better sense of Europe, Europe's own self. So, you know, these tropes, they're different, but they all convey the same point of segregation, right? Savages can't explain themselves, can't speak for themselves, the civilized can do it for them. Primitives, they have very contained and particular knowledge. They can't really explain themselves and they certainly can't explain anybody else, but the moderns can. They have a self-reflexive faculty which allows them to be universal. And then in terms of the episteme, well, there is one episteme, meaning there is a modern episteme which everything has to be interpreted through. Other peoples, other traditions, they're just thought. They're not, they're not adequate, not competent, they're just thought. And you can use it as data. Oh, I'm going to do some stuff on African thought. Yeah, that would be interesting. So I've got my frameworks, and my frameworks are about, say, failed states and modernity and all that, and then I'm going to look at what Africans say and interpret it through those frameworks. Do you see what I mean? This is coloniality. It's about segregation, epistemic segregation. Decoloniality is always in a relationship with coloniality, but it's pointing to something else, the other side, the thing which runs besides coloniality. And that is that living knowledge traditions are always being creatively retrieved. They're always being creatively retrieved, even if they're outlawed by coloniality. They're always being creatively retrieved. As they do that, there is a recultivation of relations between peoples. When I say otherwise, I mean in ways which are otherwise to what modernity or the modern episteme would expect. And all this is to do with making people who have been erased, and the living knowledge traditions of people who have been erased, not just present, but a presence <coughs> matters. <coughs> and that presence is about healing the wounds of epistemic difference, or in other words, is a project of epistemic justice. If I carried on like this all the time, right, You'd be starting to feel, shut up, <laughs> shut up, I want to say something, right? So epistemic justice is when I drop the mic and we have a circle and we have a dialogue. This picture is Sankofa, which is a, a symbol, an Akan symbol, which means go back and take something that is valuable. So I contrast that icon with this icon of segregation. You with me so far, kind of? Awesome. <laughs> right. Let me apply this then to where we are in the UK Academy at the moment. And especially with, as I said at the beginning, presence of black peoples in UK Academy. And I said the presence, not just the present, but I want to look at the presence, what kind of presence there is of black people in the UK Academy. And to do that, I want to go back to this guy. Lord Robbins, who wrote a very famous report in 1963 which inaugurated the expansion of higher education in Britain so that it was a mass higher education system. Before that, prior to that, it had been a very elitist affair. <coughs> but the university systems that we have now, especially in the UK, come from this Robbins report, which inaugurated the expansion so that 
you know, 40% of the UK population would be expected to be in high, higher education. Right? Now, you might think, that sounds really good. And it does sound really good, because remember when I said about epistemic difference, it manifests sometimes in terms of lay and scientific. And now the lay people, they say, no, you can come in. You can come in and be scientists too. And Robbins based his report on four principles. One was that universities still had to impart technical skills, but it also had to cultivate citizens. You know, that old kind of idea of building, that old idea of, of what learning should be about. And also, from the Humboldt stuff, that, that these these higher education systems have to combine teaching and research. So Robbins would say, as we expand and open up higher education to the masses, as we bring the lay people in, we don't want to bring them in just to make them little technicians. We want to bring them in to, in, to take part in the same experience that we're taking part in as elites. That's what the report was about. And it was expressed in this form principle. Let me read it out. <clears throat> the purpose of the university is also to be the transmission of a common culture and common standards of citizenship. We believe it's a proper function of higher education, as of education in schools, to provide in partnership with the family that background of culture and social habit upon which a healthy society depends. This function, important at all times, is perhaps especially important in an age that has set for itself the ideal of equality of opportunity. It's not merely by providing places for students from all classes that so the idea will be achieved, but also by providing in the atmosphere of the institutions in which students live and work, influences that in some measure compensate for any inequalities in home background. These influences are not limited to the student population. Universities and colleges have an important role to play in the general cultural life of the communities in which they're situated. So there's a couple of things going on here. On the one hand, it seems that Robin is, Robbins is saying, we must get rid of this segregation between university, science, scientists, and communities, culture, lay. We have to get rid of that distinction. In actual fact, what he was saying was that, no, what we are doing is, we're opening up the relationship between universe and communities so that communities can assimilate towards the value systems which are held and propagated by the elites who already exist in university. So in actual fact, Robin's point was about one of assimilation. All these people, these women, these working class, especially these migrants, we have to give them a fair go. And the way we give them a fair go is enable them to fully assimilate and that is what the equitability is going to be about, assimilating them into this value system that we already have at university. But you can see how that could be read in a different way. And that was how it was read in a different way by certain peoples. Because in the late 60s, the 1970s, <coughs> the 1980s, lots of non-traditional students did start coming into university. And what they started to do, and it's not individual, and it's not by intention necessarily, but they came in and they saw and they read a milieu which was very different to where they were coming from. So people were saying, you talk about this, right, but where are the women? Where are the women, Marx? You talk about the, you know, the working day between 9 and 5, but what, did, what about the day between 5 p.m. and 9 a.m.? Where are the women? They're saying, where are the black people? Where are the brown people? Why are we reading these, you know, DWGM, these dead white German men? <laughs> I mean, they're kind of interesting, right? But is it only dead white German men who wrote anything of interest? Because when I look at that, I don't see me in it. I'm, I'm thinking, maybe I'll have nothing. Maybe I'll come from nothing. Maybe my experience or my heritage has nothing to give to the, you know, to the to the to the, to the whole fabric of humanity. Maybe I just have. To, maybe you've got it, 
and I just have to learn off you. But that can't be right because I'm here. And I know I've got a history because I've heard things in my own family about people doing politics and people thinking about different things. Why isn't it there? We need to have it there. And what happened in the UK Academy, especially from the 80s, in, the, in the 1980s, was a movement of epistemic justice, whereby various black and brown communities actually got linked into universities at quite a molecular level, meaning that they, the community intellectuals which already existed found their ways into university and made university actually relate to the concerns and make, make itself relative, relevant to the concerns of the communities which surrounded it. In other words, the community started to get a presence in academia. It wasn't just that the individuals from the communities were present, they started to get a presence. There was a process of epistemic justice going on, and it was driven by demography, moving peoples into this space. Well, recently, <laughs> something's happened which has kind of put that in abeyance. And in 2010, there was this famous Brown Report, which inaugurated this, this era which we're in now. And this is an era whereby um, universities are supposed to make themselves more like a business, run like a business, run according to market principles. And Brown's report in 2010, which the, the Lib Dems and the Conservatives, you know, it was written before that, but they put it into action. And in fact, did things worse than even that Brown was um, suggesting. But the Brown Report lays out new principles for universities. One is international competitiveness. Students should pay more to give more. So it's on a consumer basis and it's a global market. As a university, you better make sure you're giving value added to your students because if you're not, it's a global market that can go somewhere else. From student to consumer, student choice should be increased, right? So they're basically saying, if they buy it, then you must sell it. <laughs> not, here it is, you must learn it. If they buy it, then you've got to sell it. And if they're not buying it, then don't sell it. Sell something which they buy. And the last one was access for all. But of course, that's a very weak proposition when all your other principles are based on market logic. The important thing is that Robin's fourth principle, that one about equality and community, that one which was subverted into a decolonizing agenda, that one disappears. In its place comes internationalization, because this is a global market. So internationalization took the place of social justice relating to the communities which actually serve the university. And we know that International student numbers have gone through the roof. They're an ever more increasingly important part of universities' budgets. Um, and you'll see that this internationalization is not just about people from Europe going to other European countries or people from North America going to European countries. It's, it's, it's pretty global, right? It's involving many of the old ex colonial world as well. And I've got nothing bad to say about that. But what I do want to point out is that this internationalization agenda has actually shifted the whole terrain of social justice. We're moving from social justice to diversity. That's what we're doing. Diversity for diversity's sake. And in that respect, what I'm saying to you is that the notion of presence you being in a room makes a difference to the whole room. We've actually moved back through the international, internationalization agenda to just people being present. Diversity is about people being present, not presence. So it's great we've got a whole load of you know, faces from white to beige to brown to black, and that's fantastic, and that's diversity. But it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make a difference. That's the thing that I'm talking about. And that's what this project of 
decolonizing the academy. And especially the, one, the, the way that I was talking about it with relationship to black communities. That's what it's caught between now. It's caught between this old assimilation model and this new diversity model. And both of them empty out presence and just make people present. Old Britannica, the subalterns, all that kind of thing. That has big effects. When people can't have a presence, but can only be present, it radically affects how it is that they interact in a space. It has empirical consequences. <coughs> Let me give you some figures. 3.3% of the UK population are black. 6% of the student population are black. Radical over-representation. Looking really good. 85 black professors in the UK. 85. 17 black women professors in the UK. At the whole of UK academia. That's 0.49% of all professors. Only 15, one five, count them, black academics and senior management roles in the whole of the UK academia. For undergraduates, white women undergraduates who get <coughs> first, the percent of white women undergraduates who get first is 18.3%. 18.3% of white women end up with the first. 5.7% of black women end up with the first. Here's some comments. Not able to express or hear our own experience in learning. I feel alone. I wonder, should I be here? Do I have a right to be here, even though I'm not an international student? There is a standard way of thinking that is hegemonically <coughs> white. So I'm saying there are empirical, substantive consequences to being made just present and having presence taken away from you. And I'm into presence because I'm into decoloniality. So I'm thinking, how can we decolonize the academy, right, so that we get presence and epistemic justice and proper democratization back on the agenda? And to that, <coughs> I'm looking at this guy, a guy called Edward Lyman. Born in 1932 in St. Thomas, Danish West Indies, to free parents of Igbo descent. And it's important to recognize that because Blyden is part of a family which is keeping a living knowledge tradition alive. They know where they're coming from. They know where they're coming from. They know where they're coming from. Blyden is trying to keep those living knowledge traditions, those things beside the subaltern and Eurasia, alive. 1850, he travels to New Jersey to enroll at Rutgers College. He's denied entry due to his race. 1851, he migrates to Liberia, and he studies there, and he settles there, and he teaches there. Liberia, of course, is initially created by the American Colonization Society. Organized in 1816, its constitution is not an abolitionist society. It's not interested in abolition of enslaved Africans. It's not interested in that. It wants to get rid of the free people of colour who are not slaves. That's what it wants to do. Or as one of its famous um, propagandists says, they want to rid our country of a useless and pernicious, if not dangerous, portion of its population. Or as President Monroe said, a class of very dangerous people. So catch the epistemic difference here. These people who are free, they're not free, free. They're dangerously free because they're not competent. They're not competent to reason. They're these, what Hegel says, the dogs. There was a liberal wing to the American Colonization Society which said that, well, if we put in place a black republic somewhere else, it could draw the free blacks out of the US by persuasion and not force. And in 1822, the Colonization Society intimidates the king of Basa country to sell land on the coast, calls the capital Monrovia after President Monroe, who called free blacks a class of very dangerous people. 4,000 people resettled by 1843. 1847, it becomes a republic. 
The preamble to the Constitution says, Liberia is an asylum from the most grinding oppression. In coming to the shores of Africa, we indulged the pleasing hope that we would be permitted to exercise and improve those faculties which impart to man his dignity to nourish in our hearts the flame of honourable ambition, cherish and indulge those aspirations which a beneficent creator had implanted in every human heart, and to convince all who despise, ridicule and oppress our race that we possess with them a common nature, no epistemic difference, are with them susceptible of equal refinement and capable of equal advancement, so epistemic equality, epistemic equality justice. That's what the Liberia Constitution is basically stipulating, right? But the American Liberians, they actually, when they get there, they reinvent and recast the epistemic difference by virtue of them being more civilized, coming from America, and the indigenous peoples not being civilized. So at the same time as they're doing a decolonial thing, they're doing a colonial thing, right? In other words, they were only present in the US if they weren't just the ones. And they wanted to get presents. And they got presents by founding a republic in Liberia. But as they took their own presents, they made the indigenous peoples there just present, if not to be erased. And this is Blyden's problem. He decries the colonizing mentality of the free African Americans. He's not an African American. He's from St. Thomas. Danish West Indies, people of Igbo descent, he's trying to keep alive the living knowledge traditions which he has inherited. He decries the colonizing mentality of the African Americans. He says providence, they say, directs them to rule over the natives. But still, all the American Liberians seem to just settle on the coast. They don't want to go inland. They want to stay close to America. That thing which allows them to say that they're civilized. They don't want to go into the hinterlands. They don't want to settle in and have intercourse, social intercourse with the hinterlands, unless they're going to do like a, a raid or something like that. <coughs> Liberia College, this thing in the right here, Liberia College is going to be the institution which teaches and reproduces epistemic difference. But not if Blyden can help it. Blyden as a different compass. And he says, Providence is calling me to the interior. In 1882, he's made president of Liberia College. And his commencement address details the aims and methods of a liberal education for Liberians. We must study our brethren in the interior who know better than we do the laws of growth for the race. We look too much to foreigners and are dazzled almost to blindness by their exploits so it's the fancy that they have exhausted the possibilities of humanity. European literature, Leiden says, has made the American Negro too full. Sifting, though, through the media intellectual resources that they have been given in America, Leiden endorses the reading of the classics, the Greek and Roman classics. Greeks and Romans will be used as a means by which to build a humanistic an African outlook. And it's important, this point, because at that point in the US, with the creation of black colleges in the South, the one thing which black peoples were never given in their education is the classics, because the classics do what? They cultivate reason. And black people, what? Well, they can't cultivate reason, so they have to be technicians. So many of the black scholars in the South in the 1800s they voraciously defended their reading of what might be considered Eurocentric classics because that access to those books and that reading of them actually was the sign of their humanity, that they could reason. And Blyden doesn't want to give that up to these people. Still, what he does is he commits treason and he says, the classics, all right, <laughs> but everything afterwards from Europe, no, we're not going to teach that because that's sodden in colonialism and slavery. So we'll teach the Greek and the Roman classics, but we won't teach them the rest of Europe. We'll just take that out. We don't need the rest. Leiden's also keen to introduce Arabic, because that seems to be the lingua franca of the indigenous peoples, and some of the principal native languages 
of the region. We have men, he says, who can talk glibly about London, Paris, but know nothing about villages and towns just a few hundred miles away. And he makes a bold proposition. It's a decolonial move, geographically. He wants to physically relocate Liberia College away from the seaboard into the interior, away from the seaboard and its constant intercourse with foreign manners and low foreign ideas. <coughs> Blyden wants the college to have free and uninterrupted intercourse with the intelligent among the tribes of the interior so that students, even from the books to which they will be allowed access, they conveniently flee to the forests and fields of Manding and the Niger and mingle with our brethren and gather fresh inspiration and fresh and living ideas. And women are to be foundationally included in this exercise. How should we make our lives sublime? Concludes Blyden in the commencement address. Not by imitating others, but by doing well our own part as they did theirs. So let me recap on Blyden's Pan-African pedagogy in relation to what I was talking about in terms of coloniality, decoloniality. Coloniality is about epistemic difference, erasure, or if you're lucky, just to be present. Decoloniality is about epistemic justice. It's about retrieval of not living knowledge traditions, unsubordinate, relatable selves, not, not subordinate, and presence. Blyden's pedagogy then is A, repair the classics, repair the classics, retrieve the living thoughts, knowledge traditions of the interior, and recultivate intellectual relations with the peoples of the interior so that they have presence in the academy. So I'm winding my way back now. And I want to apply Blyden's Pan-African Pedagogy to the present day UK Academy and the decolonizing of the academy. Our interiors at the moment are not out there. Our interiors are the marginalised communities which have been leapfrog over in the rush to the global market. That replacement of social justice by internationalisation and diversity. Our interiors are just down the road. They're the things which have been neglected. Therefore, coloniality at the moment, to me, in the UK Academy, is about the neoliberal internationalisation of it. It's about changing, shifting, or, or erasing presence and just turning it into being present again. So, diversity offices now, they are obsessed with international students, partly because of the money, a good part because of the money, right? But also, so they can tick the box and say, do you know how many brown faces we have? Do you know how many black faces we have? But the actual culture of the university itself remains how it was. And I was saying, I was saying that what was happening in the 70s and 80s was something different. That was being challenged. Saying, no, it's not enough just to be present. We have to have a presence. And that means transforming the culture of the <coughs> institution so that it's pluralistic. We decolonize it. So therefore, for me, if I follow Blyden, I would have to say that to decolonize the academy means diverse black peoples would have to be intellectually relating to peoples of the interior. So it might be that lots of international students from various African countries, Caribbean countries, would have to actually study at the UK and relate to peoples of the interior who are already there, which are already quite a diverse and mixed bunch, by the way. There were always links and relationships to retrieve. Retrieve the living thought traditions of the interior for epistemic justice so that there is a black presence, which is social justice, not just pre black people being present. Of course, none of that which I've said talks to Blyden's other project, which was to repair the classics. And in this respect, I wonder what we can repair. Because Biden goes back to the Greeks and the Romans, but the classics which we are talking about are people like Kant and Hegel. Most of the ed edifice of the classical European canon is about creating and maintaining epistemic difference. 
And of course, IR has its own classics which does exactly the same. And I'll go back to EH car. Because EHR's, EH car's um, whole reasoning, why it is the case that realism is stronger than utopianism? Why we shouldn't expect the league to actually have worked on liberal principles? Is because he says, you know, realism is a, is a, is a, is a um, the ontology of human beings is a realist one. People are after their interests, you know, and they make up justifications for their interests based in universal language, but it's never universal language. It's actually, you know, interest based. But he says something interesting in order to get to that position. And this is what he says. He uses, um, uh, what's his name, T.H. Hobhouse's racist asser assertion from the early 19th, 20th century. That primitive peoples, and this is E.H. Carr's words, primitive peoples can't separate emotion from truth. So remember that epistemic difference I was talking about in terms of primitives and moderns? Primitive people can't separate emotion from truth, which means that they can't have a universal discourse. They can't be scientific. They're not part of the episteme. They just can't separate emotion from truth. And what Carr does is he charges the lead with primitive utopianism. Primitive utopianism. So those who support the league, primitive. And those who know the real deal about politics, the realists, they're the moderns. And the moderns will tell the league people, the people who support the league, something about themselves. Which is why, finally, I would say if you can't retrieve the classics, then you can actually create some new classics. And that's why I think it's important that Haile Selassie's speech to the League of Nations should be taught in the first few weeks of IR courses for undergraduates. Because I'm arguing that a black presence in the academy has to be pursued as part of the reparations of the wounds to humanity visited by colonialism and slavery. It's for everybody. It's for everybody. But decolonization means actually everybody has to give something. All right, thank you so much. So we'll sit down quietly for the, the second round of this. Thank you so much for your presentation. I think it was really uh, thought provoking, mind broadening in many ways. I think it's also, there's a lot of things for thought there. I'm sure you'll have an interesting discussion. But as you said, this is a time for epistemic justice. When you put the microphone down, there is interaction between the audience and you. This is a time for epistemic justice. So I hope the audience will not just be present, but actually show its presence and will actually participate, challenge views, enter into a discussion. And at this stage, I do not want to abuse my position as a chair. So I want to give the audience the chance to ask uh, questions. Uh, maybe we'll collect a couple of questions and have a few rounds of questions in that way. Can I invite questions? But just to break the yeah, yes, there's one there, please. Yeah, thank you, Alastair, for the amazing speech. Uh, the one question pops up in my mind immediately how can we change this? Because I see as well from a feminist literature, uh, once we address gender issues, for example, as well within academia, you hear in Belgium only 9% of the professors are women. Mm. But if you start to raise these issues, mm. Uh, people say, ah, you think I'm a racist, you think mm. I'm against women, and it becomes people react really offensive on these kind mm. of things. You don't, so how to reach the people we have to mm. reach, mm. Uh, who are maybe probably <coughs> not even in this room? Mm. Uh, I think it's mm. a bit more practical. Mm. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Let me see whether there are other questions at this point. Do I have a chance to reply to us, please? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a it's a question which can't be answered really, um, because that would be up to you. Um, I think that one thing is though that um, we can't rely too much on reason, <laughs> uh, because reason is actually um, reason with a big R is usually the, the, the domain of the elite, and they don't want to give up their dominance of reason. So um, I, I'll give you a little example of this. In the UK recently, we've had a resurgence of fascism. Okay, 
um, British National Party, you know, you know, that kind of thing, right? The, the far right, yeah? And um, they have been coming onto campuses. They come onto my campus a few times, because my campus is in Mile End, which is in Tower Hamlets, part, east part of London, which has historically had quite a big fascist presence because of the migration there, right? Um, now, there is a quite strong body of opinion which says, and it's probably the dominant body of opinion, which says, no, no, what we have to do is we have to have freedom of speech. So if these fascists want to come on to the university, right, then let them come on, let them speak, freedom of speech, and what we will do is we will reason with them, against them, and show them their prejudices. And hopefully the rest of the people in the room will be able to see that this prejudice is, is, is bad. And my response to that is, okay, I'm all for dialogue and all that kind of stuff. But I remember that actually this happened before. And the result of the reasoning was to say, no, they can't come onto campus. <laughs> you know, because they were stopping black and brown people from going into schools and going onto campus. There was a battle which was won to say, kick them out of campus. So now why are you saying to me that, no, we should let them in again because we need to have reason? So I think part of it is, I'm all for dialogue, obviously, right? But I'm also saying that don't, don't put too much faith in reason with a big R because it's actually, it actually belongs to someone and they don't want to let it go and they don't want to democratise it. And sometimes... You know, you need to do a bit of politics instead of reason. Please. Um, I would like to take the example of the British uh, colonialists in the 17th and 17th century in different parts of the world mm. in relation to education and religion. Uh, I would like to understand if you have any thoughts mm. or findings. How do you categorize the colonized? Like, for example, in India, mm. they were engaging in big scale Christianization in a violent way and mm. building schools at the same time. In the Arab world, they were shutting down schools. Mm. Like, for example, in Egypt today, in 1882, mm. they shut mm. down 60 schools out of 62 mm. high schools. In sub Saharan Africa, it is different. They did not engage in Christianization, but they built few schools for administrative and church uh, reasons. How would they categorize? I think I think you're bringing up a really interesting and, and, and important thing, and that's the the diversity of the colonising mission and the experience of being colonised, right? And that that um, differs not just in terms of who is doing the colonising, but also where it's taking place and when it's taking place as well. Um, what I would say, though, from what I can see is that there are some broad um, kind of um, premises for the colonising mission, which I think actually hold fairly true throughout. Interestingly, I was at a conference the other day um, in, um, in Sweden, and it was a, it was a really good post-colonial conference because, you know, the post-colonial stuff is really, to be honest, hijacked by Anglo, the Anglo world, right? So, you know, and then the Francophone world, but then everything else after that is is not really treated seriously right. And this friend of mine in Denmark said, well, you know, the thing is, if you go to Denmark, they will say, oh no, we did our colonising differently. We did it if we were exceptional because, you know, we were, did that, that, that. Go to Britain, Britain will say, oh no, we were exceptional in our colonising mission because, you know, we freed the slaves. French. No, no, we were exceptional because, you know, we were all about citizenship and assimilation and all that kind of stuff. Go to other places, they'd be like, no, 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 we're exceptional. So every European country, and most of European countries were actively involved in colonialism. The, conference, the town in which the conference I'm talking about was held, was Minshipin, which was one of the centres for the industrial production of iron manacles for enslaved Africans, right? Most of Europe was involved in colonising, but most of Europe says, no, no, we were exceptional, which is why there is no such thing as European colonisation, right? <laughs> because everybody was exceptional. 
I think there are some broad principles to do with the colonizing mission, right? One of them is you have the civilized, the modern, then you have those natives, savages, barbarians, who might be trained up, who might be redeemable, who you might be able to save. Then you have the others, and the others can't be saved, or don't wish to be saved. And some people, at some points and some time, will shift between being savable to being unsavable. And that's why policies often change. So the thing about education is often, we put education in because we think that we can save you. Oh, hold on. Now you're saying you don't want to be ruled by us. Huh. Well, you can't be saved take it away. If you look at John Stuart Mill's work, you'll find that most, a lot of his work around representative government is actually involved with that precise shift in India in 1857. Right? Um, so I would say that that to me would be the main thing to do with education. Is can, can they be redeemed? Oh no, if they can't be redeemed, i.e. assimilated or civilized, then they're unredeemable. And that's why that thing about pres being present and then being erased is a slippery slope. You can be present one day and you can be erased the next day. Because decoloniality, what the colonizing mission, what coloniality never factors in is that some people might not want to be saved, but they might not be against you either. They just want their, well, what they called in the Cold War period, non alignment. But that non alignment can't be neutral. If it's not in line, then you're against. Do you see what I mean? So I think that's that. Those are some of the key things that I would say about that question about education, which is why you know the other living knowledge traditions aren't necessarily anti, but they're for yeah. something else. Hmm. You know, let me just add a question to mm. that because I mean, I think the question sort of referred to the idea that, that maybe coloniality is, is seen very much as something rather one dimensional, mm. yeah, uh, which is a category mm. in a way as such. Mm. I was also wondering about uh, the idea of the living knowledge of traditions. Mm. Uh, this has to be something extremely pluralistic per definition because as soon as you start labeling it or so, you're again making a sort of epistemic difference, yeah. you're again creating a certain category. Yeah. So I was wondering how exactly yeah. do you see this living knowledge of tradition, yeah. except for the fact that you recognize its existence, yeah. but can you actually yeah. find it, can you determine where it is, what it consists of, without getting into that trap yeah. of again categorizing yeah. and creating that yeah. kind of difference? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really um, good question. I think um, the first thing is you can't find it. You have to find your relationship to it. Um, and that is it's an ethical question as much as it is an epistemological question. Um, that, so that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that living knowledge traditions, if I write about living knowledge traditions, I'm usually writing about, um, about it to a particular audience. So if I'm talking about the difference between coloniality and decoloniality, I will use a phrase called living knowledge traditions, which opens up or, 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 or provides a kind of... Um, a pathway towards thinking about um, things which are not anti but are for something else. When I actually work substantively on them, they're not living knowledge traditions. They have their own names and I use their own names. So I've done work with Māori uh, Matulana, which is Māori knowledge, which you can translate broadly speaking into Māori knowledge traditions. But I don't call it a living knowledge tradition, I call it what it's called. But is it also the Maori tradition is not a one-dimensional tradition? Absolutely not. Uh, yeah. Absolutely not. But it has actually quite broad cosmological um, principles, which then get um, picked up in different ways by different peoples, which can cause both um, uh, collectivity and unan unanimity, and also cause dissension. Uh, the interesting thing is that in the the Maori wars of the 1860s, but they weren't Maori wars, they were wars against the settler regime who were taking the land, right? In those wars, the Maori didn't lose, right? They didn't lose, but the, the British forces won, right? But the Maori didn't lose. The reason why was because some of the Maori tribes um, aligned themselves with the British forces because the British forces were against some of their, the Maori 
enemies, their own bloody enemies, right? So even taking part in this war was actually much more to do with a much longer history, like I showed you in the Aztec map, much longer history of Maori history than it was to do with um, suddenly everything now is about the settler regime. Everything is about, it's, it's an appendage to, to European history. So I think, um, to, to sum it up, I'm not for a universal, right? I don't like universals, but I do like concrete generalities. And so with the knowledge traditions that I'm talking about and I work with, there are not claims made on universal, universal claims made, but there are claims made which have general significance or general consequences, but that requires you then to relate to them rather than to assimilate them or to be assimilated by them. Mm. Okay, thank you. Any small questions or thoughts? Feel free to come up with uh, challenging thoughts on that. I think we're all asking the same thing, and, and you're getting to a clear answer. Shall I understand your position that you're not against epistemic difference, but you're actually against the stratification of that difference? Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's right, okay. that's right. Um, but but the word difference, I would not use. I would use relation. Okay. Yeah. Which is why I was um, <laughs> Oh no, wrong one. Oh no. Ah, never mind. Wait a minute. I'm getting one. Which is why <laughs> that that symbol, that that's difference to me. That is relation. But don't you think there's already a big difference in the UK system? Um, when you look at SOAS, for instance, you look at the cylinders of uh, uh, the migration force, for instance, there's a lot of uh, literature of uh, African, for instance, African um, authors as well. So don't you think there's already a change happening towards a more open-minded uh, mm. institutionalism? Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. I think I think that's true, but I, I would I would put a different timeline on it. I would say this is actually the moment where we're seeing its eclipse, and I think those those um, especially the literature stuff that come up in a, in a political time. You know, it was a, it, it was a, it was about openings, right? For, openings which were forced upon the academy, right? Um, and I think what we're seeing now is actually the, the slow eclipse, especially to do with the draining of. Um, um, budgets for the humanities um, in many places which I know are associated with, for example, post-colonial literature, and I was at one the other day, someone was telling me that the people who were teaching post-colonial literature have gone or been let go, and they are not being replaced. They're being replaced by people who are doing Eng English, English lit <laughs> and, and French lit. So in, a, in actual fact, I would say to you, what, what you're talking about is a sign of that moment of decolonization which I was talking about. But I'm not optimistic about the direction in which she's been heading th these days. I think um, when you get to the social science, it's even more acute, that, that kind of thing. It's, it's really quite acute. Um, I would hazard a guess to say that, for example, in international relations, 99.9% .9 of people who do an international relations degree, even if they do modules on Africa this, Africa that, will never read an African author. And if they do, it won't be as someone who provides general theoretical frameworks through which to understand the African continent. Mm. Chris, there's a question in the back. Um, when you Um, that's an awesome question, and from what I can see that we're doing at the moment, 
I would say that um, it's about organisation. Organisation so that we actually cultivate the other reasons and not actually try to confront the big reason and say we want a slice of that, but to actually um, organise around cultivating and valuing the other reasons, the other living knowledge traditions, which in themselves always have aspects of that big R. They always have it, right? But they have it in a different constellation. So that's what I would say, that's my answer to that. And it also requires um, a link up between black academics and black students. And it also, of course, requires support from non-black academics and non-black students. I know lots of people who provide, who are willing and who provide that support, you know, because they realise that actually this thing is de detrimental to them, because they want to actually have a proper edifying experience at university, and they don't want to be captured by the big R either. The only way to do that is to organise in terms of journals, courses, conferences, extracurricular events, and most importantly for me, always linking these up with community. Always linking these up with community, because that's where people are coming from. And if, and if they can't feel that they can bring it with them, then they will disengage and detach, and the big R will just keep swaying. Okay. Some question there? Uh, yes, I have uh, two questions. Actually, I was um, wondering if the reason you focused on the uh, black uh, students and academics was because you thought uh, that maybe each different group of so called others had to um, you know, fight for themselves or have their own reflection about mm -hmm. what to do, etc. Mm -hmm. Or if it was to avoid this other category that everything normalizes just altogether. Mm -hmm. Um, and wondering about the relation, of, or possible relation with the South Asian, uh, people of South Asian origin in the UK, because there are, I think there's more uh, literature that is uh, present uh, in the curricula. Uh, so just wondering about uh, that. And I have another uh, question, which uh, relates to the uh, practical things that can be done. Um, and especially because you uh, said that 85 professors only. Mm. And in, for women, uh, there's people who, uh, who are saying, well, we should uh, do practical things uh, to help women in their careers. Uh, for example, mm. provide childcare and conferences, mm. uh, things like that, that can help mm. along the career. So do you mm. have uh, ideas of mm. very small yeah. practical things that could be done? Yeah. Let me do that last question first, and then tell me again the first question, because I had it in my head, but let me just do <laughs> the first question, right? Okay. Um, one of the things is to um, create um, uh, uh, networks, mentoring networks, um, because probably one of the main reasons why black academics don't seem to get the, um, the progression um, that other academics get, in relative terms, is to do with the fact that as early career academics, as PhD students, I hate to say it, but you know, it, it statistically, it's not untrue to say that black PhD students are not entered into, or not encouraged, or are not brought into the same intellectual academic networks that their white peers are, are brought into. It's, 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 it, it's, it's the case. And that might be too, and I'm not saying that the supervisors are racist or anything like that, because we know that these kind of issues work at a much more subconscious level, right? Um, so one of the solutions to that is to actually develop net networks in lieu of that, right? Um, things to do with, for example, how is it that you submit to a journal? What is the politics of submitting to journals? You know, what, what, what tricks do you need to know? Which journal should you submit to? Why is it that you will keep getting rejected if you don't do this, that, and the other? So very technical or craft you know, um, knowledge, which often um, early career black academics are not actually given by their, their mentors. Right. So I would say that is one of the big things. And we have developed, there's a network which has been developed in the UK called Black British Academics, which is actually <coughs> open to everybody. It's not a race thing. 
but is purposed is to actually inculcate and um, encourage um, and improve networking amongst black academics. Your first question was about South Asian. Uh, yeah, or sure. Relations with other yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The reason I'm picking it is because that's where I'm coming from, right? And as I was, I was saying to, um, to Tom in terms of um, the living knowledge traditions, you know, I, I'm, I'm not talking about it in the abstract, I'm talking about it from where I'm coming from, and then I will relate from where I'm coming from. Do you see what I mean? But I also have an accountability to where I'm coming from as well. So I will come to it concretely and relate concretely, right? Uh, which is why I don't use the word BME, which is, you know, really is black and minority ethnic. Because it, it's a category of segregation and control, to, to be honest for me. One of the all re reasons why I'm concentrating on black academics as well, or black academy, is because when you look at some of the key statistics, black students and academics fare by far the worst, even in relation to other minority ethnic um, groups. By far. By far. So black students have the worst attainments vis-a-vis -vis not just white students, but in Britain what they call Asian students, Chinese students, whatever. Right? The only other group which comes close to black students and academics is Bangladeshi in the UK. And that's to do with a particular history of, um, of, of being poor, being in Britain for quite a long time. And, um, have shown very similar um, experiences of always being leapfrogged over. Um, same with black academics. It, 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 so, so I, I'm saying that in, black, in, in UK academia, black students and academics fare the worst. And it's not because they come in with a deficit. That's a myth. It's not. It's because what they come in with is not valued in university. That's what the point is. So relating to other groups, I would say, therefore, that what we are trying to do is going to be a benefit to everybody who is suffering from something like that. It's really simple. And of course, then there is a, a, then there is a requirement to, to work in broader, you know, in, in, in broader organisations for these kind of things, which is, which is absolutely sensible um, for me. But I'll say just one word of, of caution which is that um, I know um, many academics from um, a South Asian heritage who to this day call themselves black, right? And they do it on a principle. You know, they do it kind of the Steve B type thing, you know, we're not non-white, we're black because it's a political term and we're invested in this struggle against discrimination, right? But in a broader sense, what happened in the UK is that after the 1980s, and it's a horrible thing to say, but ethnic minority groups separated out. They separated out. And people who at one point called themselves black then started to call themselves brown. So I'm also saying that there is a politics within the thing as well, you know, which is why I am coming from that perspective um, of, 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 of black academia, because I think that actually has to be made accountable has to be represented and made accountable because it's often elided. When you, often you'll see um, statistics and diversity will be following the money. So people say we're really diverse, but what's happened is there's a lot of Chinese international students who have come. You know, and they say, see how diverse we are. So I'm about the inequalities, right? If at one day it turns out that the Chinese students are getting the worst, then I would have to be right there with them. Mm. Back to Albina, and I see two more questions in the back. Uh, Albina, please. I just heard you say mm -hmm. that uh, black <coughs> academics are fair poorly, uh, not because of any deficiency, mm -hmm. but because what they come with is, is not valued. Mm -hmm. But you are essentializing in blackness in this way. No. Before that, you were saying that black students and uh, doctoral students are not given sufficient information on you know, the peer review play. So that kind of deficiency, and I understand that this kind of injustice should be repaired. But later you were saying that there is kind of essence to blackness that is not being valued. So I'm confused. 
Mm. On why, sh on in what sense blackness is a problem? Mm. What I said was that black students and academics, when they come into university, what they come with is not valued. I didn't say it was blackness. Oh, I said, yeah, but there is some, something they come with that, that is related directly to what you call black students. So there's That's an fine, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's blackness. That's what you said. I didn't say that. Okay, I, said, I said what they come in with in terms of their lived experiences, their family backgrounds, their social capitals, their cultural capitals, <laughs> their ways of being are not valued when they come into academia. And they're not valued because then in academia they are considered something to do with black in a negative sense, right? But these people coming in, they might or might not think like that. But all they know is that their things which they're coming in with suddenly have no value whatsoever. So that's the, that's the point that I'm making. The second thing that you were saying, sorry? Well, yeah, I thought that this is your way of essentializing because you're drawing, you're saying, what they come with is different from what white people are coming with. Well, that's not an essentialization. That's just saying that what these people come with is not valued, but what, what white people come with are valued because, because in this respect, we're talking about a structure of racial inequality. A thing called white supremacy, as one of their students said, this is about there's a white hegemonic way of thinking, which isn't to say that every white person thinks like that. But it's a structure which values some things and doesn't value other things. In that respect, then black people don't come with a deficit to university. And in fact, that deficit is introduced in university, which is why I was saying that the early career black uh, academics, PhDs, they're not deficient, but they are not given what other people are given. So it's about an, an injustice or an inequality. It's not about deficiency. Mm. Okay, there were three more questions. Let me see if there are more in the meantime, otherwise we may take uh, two together. Okay, let's go over them first uh, in the back, please. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation and thank you for coming. Uh, I do have um, a question. I was wondering if the creation of presence, is this a solvable problem or is this something that will always occur because uh, we're dealing with ethnic minorities and an ethnic minority will always be small. Therefore, the problem will most likely always be present. So can we create presence uh, with ethnic minorities? I think there's probably a couple of things to say about that. The first thing is um, everybody in this room, I would, I would assume, has a operates as if they have a presence, right? And it's the environment which conspires to take that away, all right? So it's not about manufacturing or creating a presence. It's about redeeming a presence, right? Something which is already there. Um, and so from that respect, I would then say, why is being a minority why, that, why is it that being a minority is necessarily about having a presence taken away? I can think, for example, in colonial times, settlers in Rhodesia, you know, um, European traders in Hong Kong, etc., etc. They were minorities, but they had presence. So being a minority doesn't necessarily mean, there's nothing ontological about being a minority, which means that you don't have a presence. There is a structure in place, which makes it such that certain peoples who are deemed minorities, by virtue of being deemed a minority, then have presence taken away from them. One example of that is that I know a lot of people, say in Britain, who don't consider themselves, even if they're black, they don't consider themselves to be a minority, but they consider themselves to be another majority because they have a Pan-African outlook. So even what we understand as minority, we have to think about in terms of a national framework. And national frameworks always conspire to rob various peoples of presence. Okay, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I really liked how you were talking about this neoliberal notion of diversity that a lot of universities in Britain now are trying to um, work upon in order to get all these fancy awards. And, um, 
uh, I was wondering family equality work in Greece and Edinburgh. And um, we are uh, wondering why Edinburgh, as one of the Brussels Group universities, has so few applicants who are British, but of color. And um, I was wondering if, in your research, um, if you distinguish between Brussels Group universities and universities, if you know Edinburgh University and Edinburgh Napier yeah, next door, which is yeah. a lot more. Uh, absolutely. Um, I think one of the statistics was that a university called London Metropolitan University, which um, is what um, is perceived, I mean, this is nothing to do with the, uh, the academics and the students who actually work there, but in ranking systems and ranking tables, it's perceived to be uh, you know, pretty much at the bottom of the ranking tables for UK universities, right? London Met, um, a few years ago, uh, took more black students, um, just one university, than half of the whole Russell Group. Right? So Russell Group universities, by and large, are far more elitist, but even when they have a bit of diversity, it's more likely to be the global elite which makes it diverse. <coughs> so with Edinburgh, I'm guessing Scottish students? Well, the thing, I think in, in Scotland it's a bit different, yeah. because we've got this yeah. 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 But it, it works out on a very similar principle. Yeah, yeah. And and so what I'm saying is, I I I want all internationalisation agendas in the university to be congenitally linked to social justice agendas and equality. I'm not saying, I assume you know, you know that I was not saying this, but I'm not saying that international students shouldn't come to Europe, right? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the internationalization agenda has to be congenitally related to the social justice agenda in, in the places, and that will be better for international students in the long run too. Okay, and then one last question, I think, Shubhansha, It's not a question, but mm -hmm. it's how I sort of relate to uh, mm -hmm. uh, your presentation, mm -hmm. and not about an experience, uh, mm -hmm. my experience in a Western university, but mm -hmm. I'll go back home, and mm -hmm. I'll, uh, 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 we did a study in the university that I come from that uh, people from the lower caste were mm -hmm. uh, scoring very less on VIVA uh, marks. However, they were scoring very well uh, in the written examination. So, which is when we had to sort of uh, mobilize support and uh, put a, a pressure on the administration that the viva marks should not have any bearing on the overall <laughs> results because it is the examining board which uh, has a bias towards people coming from low caste on where, or the, how right. they dress, how right. they speak English, uh, how how are they able to put forward their argument, right. which is a which may be different from the social backgrounds that they're coming from. Yeah. So, you know, this deficiency is not something I, I, I yeah. thought in thin air, but there, is, there are practical examples of yes. proving uh, uh, that argument. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. 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 No, absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's a fantastic case, right? Mm. Um, uh, very similar um, to what m people think in the UK is one of the issues with this attainment thing, which is that particular expressions mm. of reason are valued as more intellectually astute than others and so assignments and assessments tend to be quite um, uniform so slightly different to the UK in the UK but the standard modes of assessment in the UK are research essay and exam right and there are lots of other different modes of assessments which could happen but it just so happens that in the UK, those seem to tend to privilege those with privilege already. And so that's one of the reasons why. And now we talk about, and I'm for, diversifying assessments because that plays to different peoples what they come with, right? People, if they come from a, a, a family whereby reason is seen as abstract and you work it out on a paper, right? All right, so then you're going to do well at university, but what if reason is more concrete to you? What if you work it out in different ways? What if you're critical in other ways? Then all that you've got is lost when you have to go and write a research essay. And even if you're actually a top-ranking student, you'll be getting middle marks. But, 
the academic established academia in general, I can tell you that when I have these discussions, the majority of academics I have discussions with are absolutely insistent that the research essay and the exam are the things which really determine whether you are an intellectual. And of course it's because it's what they do. This is like, you know, training to be what? An academic, not a lay, right? <laughs> Everything else is lay, but that is academic. Okay, thank you very much. May I end, conclude with a provocative question again? <laughs> yeah, just because I'm also interested in, in finding out how you experience it yourself. My question is always to what extent can we escape modernity? Can we escape the our way of thinking is so much immersed by mm. concepts of enlightenment, by modern concepts, by, well, mm. European Western dominated concepts? Mm. To what extent do you find it yourself difficult to escape? I was also thinking mm. of that because you showed Tyler Selassie mm. and his speech. But actually, many of the concepts he was using, like referring to territorial integrity, are very much concepts of modernity as well. So, do you experience it as a struggle mm. that you have to sort of escape these classic categories, these classic uh, mm. epistemistic, epistemic mm. differences, or is that not the case? Mm. Mm. Well, I think again, it's it's quite interesting because, of course, that is a translation of the Amharic in which he was talking, right? And in the Amharic, there are concepts which. Which, which are not necessarily coming from European modernity. But, but it shows how difficult it is to, relate to, to do that sort of thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what it shows is that you have to do a lot more work, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I think one of the things it shows is that you can't assume. And I think a lot of critical work in the social sciences actually assumes a lot which it shouldn't assume, right? Um, for myself, I. The, 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 thing, the thing for me is actually the, why is that we, we academics seem to identify as academics as if suddenly we, we were born academics, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? And then everything else outside of academia is actually not of any consequence or significance. So I don't see myself as an academic even though I might have that title. And the reason I'm saying that is because one of the things I was talking about, the sociology of knowledge tradition, what it says is that, you know, here's modernity. Modernity is better than tradition. People are more self-reflexive in modernity. And part of the reason why modernity is better than tradition is modernity has a complex division of labor whereby actually, you know, whereby self-reflexivity becomes a expertise in itself. And the people who are the experts are the academics. <laughs> So there is a certain cachet to calling oneself an academic, which is linked to these problems of coloniality which I'm talking about. And I think that the problem that we have when we're being critical is that we actually um, segregate ourselves from ourselves. So when I'm coming to university, I'm thinking, right, what I'm doing is I'm gaining some privilege. Can I use my privilege wisely? That's what it's about. So I don't actually see in myself an existential struggle between modernity and something else. I, 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 ju I just don't. I'm not saying that modernity as a, as a, as a, as a system of epistemic power doesn't, doesn't have power, and doesn't exercise power. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying I work beside it, which is why I can actually work within academia, because I'm working beside it. I don't have to work against it. I'm working beside it. Okay. I would say thank God we're not born as academics, but it's <laughs> academics need to be reminded of that every now and then. <laughs> and in that sense, I think your talk, was, your talk was extremely interesting because it is also forcing us to do some critical introspection as academics, as universities. Also, the University of Kent has its diversity policy. Okay. Uh, I think there's a lot, uh, lot to be said about that. I very much appreciated this. I, I almost called it enlightening, but that's maybe not the right term here. <laughs> But that was very interesting, I especially very much appreciated the openness with which you talked, but also the way in which you sort of put it in a broader perspective, in the broader tradition from space, time, uh, subjectivities to the knowledge of, knowledge of traditions. So I think this, is, this was really, really interesting. The good news is that we do not have to end the discussions here because there are drinks which are provided in the students' room, which is a room by the very end of the hall here. So there's an opportunity to continue the discussion in a more informal way. But before we go there, apart from thanking our speaker, thanking the audience, I would very much like to thank Shugansu and Natalie for organizing this lecture series because it was done, this is not just very interesting, this was an excellent kickoff, but it is also done in a very efficient uh, way. So I think this is a really uh, great success. So congratulations uh, on that.
Uh, and I would also like to draw your attention to the fact that there is a next lecture coming up, in case you doubt, it's on the back here, on the 5th of November, with Oliver Richmond from the University of uh, Manchester, who will speak about peace in the 21st century and deal with the topic of interventions, a topic that is unfortunately still very high on the agenda. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Robert, and let's meet the brains.